gentlemen. We are hoping that the new generation for starting this new life, the new life of forgiveness, the life of resilience, we carry on this light so that there will be never any genocide in Rwanda or elsewhere in the country. So we were hoping by passing this light, this new generation will carry on and build a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gatete. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw our future. They are our hope. And as we say in Kinyaranda, At this time, I would like to invite Rose Gatete, a member of the Rwandan American community in the Midwest, to introduce Mr. Marguerite. Good afternoon. I have the honor and privilege to introduce our next, our next speaker, Deputy Mayor Mark Neal. Mark Neal is the Deputy Mayor of South Bend. He will serve as a Deputy Mayor for the City of South Bend during our Mayor Pete Buttigieg's deployment to Afghanistan from February 28 to September 30, 2014. He had served as South Bend City Controller since January 1, 2012. In that role, Mr. Neal oversaw the fiscal management of the city, human resources, information technology, purchasing, safety, risk management, city budget, and performance management functions. Prior to joining the city administration, Mr. Neal led his own executive and financial management consulting firm and worked on early stage ventures within the healthcare IT industry. Previously, he served, he served as the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for the Press Gaming Association, Inc. after serving in other financial management and leadership positions in the private, public, and non-profit sectors. Mr. Neer received a BBA from University of Notre Dame, an MBA from George Washington University, he currently serves on the board of directors for the YMCA of Michiana and the Fiscal National Chamber Music Association. He is also the president of the Michiana Chapter of Financial Ex Executives International, known as FEI. He lives in South Bend with his wife and their three children. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it, is a, uh, it is an honor to, to be here with you this afternoon. As Rose noted, I'm the Deputy Mayor. Our Mayor, uh, Pete Buttigieg, is a Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer serving in Afghanistan. Uh, someone, I'm often asked, uh, surely a mayor doesn't need to go to Afghanistan while he's the mayor. And uh, I'd like to say that that's the kind of guy he is. They called him and he went. Uh, so, Therefore, it's, a, it's been an honor for me to be serving here in the city. Um, when Gaetan had, had invited me to come, I confess I was uh, uh, both pleased and also a little hesitant. Um, I'm generally a, a somewhat emotional person, and I can't think of anything more emotional to uh, be here about. In the course of human history, uh, the horrors that people have committed against other people's is beyond comprehension. We've talked about it already this afternoon. How can it be? How can it happen? And uh, I know there'll be great discussion and, and searching for answers there. Um, but I know it is important for us to remember so that we don't repeat the past. And uh, we can't perhaps talk too much about it because we need to face those things so we can prevent them. 
it uh, is also a pleasure to be here to honor the survivors who are here today and to remember those who are throughout the world, and particularly in Rwanda today. Um, again, I can't imagine the suffering and pain that you have gone through, but to know that we are all here to be supportive and to understand and to all be of help. Um, I'm, I'm pleased it's occurring here in South Bend here at Notre Dame. Uh, the city is a city of, of immigrants, like all the country, but one in which I think South Bend has always welcomed immigrants and uh, known that we are, are better for those who have come here uh, to s rebuild lives or to start new lives. And uh, it is uh, a pleasure that uh, it is being held here so that we can recall the history of our area and that we can continue to build upon it. So um, my thoughts are that as we just saw with the candle ceremony, that the message, at least for me today, to all of you is this is a message of hope. It is a, commem a commemoration, it is a remembrance, but it is a message of hope that we cannot and should not and will not forget, but we ask where do we go from here? What will I do? What will we do? Who will I be? Who will we be? And how do we move forward to not allow it to happen again, but to actually build better, stronger lives? And that for those who have survived, that you too can find hope in moving forward, not forgetting the past, but having hope going forward and knowing that there's a better day tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Neal, for your kind words. Uh, the Rwandan American community is extremely grateful for your generosity and the way you welcomed us. Many of us moving to South Bend, we are new to the United States, and the community has welcomed us with open arms, and we are happy and glad to call this our home. I would now like to welcome Chapter X Choir to come to the stage. They will be singing a song titled Noah for us. The song that we're going to sing is in Bemba, that's from Zambia. It's basically saying, my brother, my sister, come. My brother, my sister, come to Christ. Because it's only in Jesus where is there's peace. Come out of this world, join with me, and live with me in Jesus forevermore.
bystanders, commentators, reporters, and even the experts. They said it's over. It's over. When they said it was over, they were talking about more than the genocide being over. They were saying the country, the people, everything connected to Rwanda, it's over. There's no hope here. There's no future here. There is no life here. On August 8, 1994, the New York Times read an article that basically said that things were not going to get better in Rwanda, that they were going to get worse, and they were going to spread throughout the region. And I quote, the article said, the prospects are grim. The New York Times. The article was a, basically a reflection of the consensus of the world. Looking into Rwanda, and they said, it's over. It's not going to get better from here. It's only going to get worse. It's over. And who could have blamed them after the genocide was over? Who could have thought that from there we would be here? From there, 1994, after 100 days of genocide, when the genocide was over, blood was everywhere, all throughout the, the streets, bodies in the mountains and in the hills, bodies in the rivers, bodies in schools, bodies in homes, bodies even in churches. Who could have thought that from there we would be here? 
all the experts said, it's over. There is no future from here. It's over. They put an X on Rwanda and they said, it is over. While the genocide survivors were trying to come to grips with what had just happened to them, the outside society said, it's over. It's like a detective coming to the scene of the crime and the survivor still being alive and fighting for her life and the detective putting a blanket over the survivor and saying, it's over. She's dead. She is finished. There is no future from here. <clears throat> they put an X on Rwanda and they said, it is over. It's over. And they would have been right if they had not taken into consideration one thing. And that is that one X factor that has taken Rwanda from hopelessness to hope. The one X factor that allowed you to move from a place of hopelessness to hope. I'm talking about faith. Faith, faith, the ultimate X factor that can change any circumstance. The ultimate X factor that has the ultimate outcome. Faith changes not what happened in the past. but it changes you from the inside. It changes how you see your past in order to have strength to move into the future. Faith, faith, faith. Is that ultimate X factor that caused people to look at death in the eyes and declare hope, love, and peace. Faith is that ultimate X factor that caused people who had lost everyone to be able to believe that they could see another day, that their sorrows was not going to be their forever tomorrows. Faith. Faith is what caused even people who were killed in the genocide to look at their killers with compassion instead of hate. Faith, faith was with the parents of one of the people here who was a pastor and their compound was surrounded by the killers. And they dragged him out of their compound, him and his wife and the other pastors. And they were going to kill them. <coughs> and the people of Gitwe were there and they were crying because their pastors were going to be killed. And this guy, this man, this man of God, this pastor looked at the women of Gitwe and said, people of Gitwe, don't cry for us because we know where we are going. Cry for your children who are committing this crime. 
And after he said that, they led them down the hill to be killed. And as they led them down the hill to be killed, they began to sing a song in their native language. It was a song of hope. But most of all, it was a song of faith. They said, we are marching to Zion. Beautiful. Beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. That beautiful city of God. And they were killed while singing that song. And the reason we know that story, the reason we know how they died, the reason we know the song that they were singing when they died, was that the people who killed them testified about the witness of their lives at the point Faith. 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 Faith is that ultimate X factor that allows us to know that even when the world seems to be out of control, there's someone still in control. That person is God. Faith allows us to keep our mind when we could easily lose our mind. Faith. Faith allows us to know that nobody can put a period on our lives. Only God can. Faith. Faith allows us to know that our circumstances, our trials and our tribulations, our adversities, and our adversaries, that they do not have the final say on our lives. That neither trials, nor tribulation, nor disease, nor anguish, nor death, not even genocide, has the final say on our lives. Faith! 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 The Bible says that faith is the evidence of things not seen and the substance of things hoped for. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. Faith is what allowed people who had lost everything to know that there was still hope on the other side. In 2007, I received the privilege of touring with a Rwandan musician in the United States. Famous Rwandan musician, and he told me his story. He told me that his parents were killed in the genocide by his neighbor, by his friend. And after that, his life spiraled out of control. It wasn't that he did not have an alcohol problem before that, but after that, it got crazy for him. He could not sing any more and he lost everything. He found himself in Uganda on the street, homeless. He could not stop drinking. He told me he went to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist couldn't help him. He told me that he went to the witch doctor and the witch doctor could not help him. But then a pastor from Congo came to him and told him, God had sent me to you. 
And the man began to pray for him. And Jean-Paul Samputu said that as the man began to pray for him, he began to throw up. And he could not stop throwing up. And he was throwing up. He said he was throwing up for one hour. And after that one hour, he said that the spirit of alcoholism had left him. He didn't understand a word that that pastor was praying over him, but what one word he could understand was the word Jesus. 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 And Jean-Paul Saputo said, I have to find out who this Jesus is. So he went to the Ugandan prayer mountain, a prayer mountain that's very famous in Uganda. He was praying there, seeking Jesus on that mountain. And he said, while praying there, he had a revelation. God spoke to him, and God told him that if you want to be completely free, you must forgive the man that killed your parents. That was hard for him to accept. He resisted, he struggled with that, but he eventually accepted it, went back to Rwanda, went to the Gachacha court, looked that man in the eye, the people in his rural village, and said, I forgive this man. From there, later on, when that man was released from, pri from prison, Jean-Paul Samputu and that man started to do a speaking tour together in Rwanda, speaking about reconciliation and forgiveness. Reconciliation and forgiveness that was birthed out of faith. 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 The Bible says that faith is the evidence of things not seen and the substance of things hoped for. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. And this man, Jean-Paul Samputu, now was set free in order now to be a reconciliator. Mm -hmm. To be a witness of the power and the grace of God. Faith. I want you to know the impact that faith does and the impact that faith has done in Rwanda. As many of you know, the church was complicit in the genocide. About 250,000 people or so were killed in churches. People went to hide in the church Adventist church, Pentecostal church, Catholic churches, and their pastors and their priests handed these people over to the killers to die and to be slaughtered. More than 200,000 people died in churches. And so when the genocide was over, people began to doubt the church. Maybe not doubt God, but they began to doubt the institution that is the church. And do you know what happened? God sent missionaries to Rwanda. People that had been refugees. And in the aftermath of the genocide, these people left from Uganda, Congo, and Rwanda, and Burundi, and came into Rwanda to build new churches 
while there were still bodies on the, on the ground. And these churches have started to become a witness of what the gospel is about. The power of God to change even the worst case scenario and bring hope out of it, bring life out of it, bring truth out of it. And I know that there are people here, all of you here, who are a witness of that, who are a fruit of that, who are a witness that even in the worst case of situations, God can write a new story. Even in the worst case situation, God can bring what other people thought was over and write a new story, a new chapter, a chapter of hope, faith, and love. I conclude Romans chapter 8, where the Apostle Paul talks about being persecuted and people being killed left and right because they are followers of Christ. And he says, nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. When I look out into this room and I see people who are more than conquerors through him that has loved you. Society said that it was over for you, that you were going to be a victim for the rest of your life. And you have become an overcomer. You have become a witness you have become a testament to the power, the grace, and the majesty of the Almighty God that is with you. We are more than conquerors. Our past is not our destiny. Our sorrows are not our forever tomorrows. Because God is with us, we shall overcome. Thank you, Paul, for your wonderful words of hope. As you said, faith is our X factor. We are here, and we will continue to have indomitable faith to continue on. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier, you might remember that I asked two questions. Where were you, or what were you doing 20 years ago this April, and what do you remember about it? And two, what does the theme remember, unite, renew mean to you? I've had some ushers passing around cards. I will read a few that I've gotten in. 20 years ago, at this time, I was with my entire country trying to hide ourselves. My father and brother were still alive with us until a few days later. 20 years ago, I was at Southwestern Michigan College working with U.S. students from Rwanda who had just gotten word that their families were slaughtered. I was working to keep these students safe. 20. Feel free to fill out the note cards and I will read your messages as opportunity prevails. Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, many Rwandans in this room lost their families, including their children, their parents, their siblings, their aunts, uncles, friends, relatives, and co-workers. They seldom find words to describe what this loss and this void has left. Thus, it is in hopes of replenishing this void that we remember and think of them every day. Who they would be, how many children they would have, what occupations they would hold, 
and what memories we would share. Today, we wanted to remember them in a special way and to share who they were when they were taken from us. A PowerPoint presentation has been prepared with some of the last remaining photos we have of our loved ones. We hope to share a glimpse with you of the impact that genocide has had on so many of us in this room you interact with every day.
As we continue on, I will read a few more messages from people in the audience. Of those who were killed, to remember means to take the lessons of the past to ensure a better future. To unite means everyone worldwide joining Rwandans to build a better future. To renew means to reestablish which was. To reestablish which was, but to build, create something better. My prayers are with you. You are a wonderful people. I wasn't alive 20 years ago, but I'm glad that I came from a country with such a horrific past, but one that can still preserve despite it. 20 years ago, I was hiding while pregnant. I was in a roof for days. I was taken to a pit hole and God stopped the killers. I remember seeing God's hand in my life. Three months of intense weakness, no food, but God said, you will live. Today, I know I survived for a purpose. During the genocide, I was in my country, Rwanda. I was only 10 years old. I remember everything like it was yesterday. I have lost my entire family. I thank God that I survived now. I'm here with my little family God has blessed me with. I was living in Washington, D.C., where you have the best political news coverage in the USA. And not, no, one there was, no one there really knew what was happening in Rwanda. To give respect in a special way to our loved ones, we will observe a moment of silence. We'll, we'll, we will reflect on the lives of those you just saw in the PowerPoint presentation, and so many more, accounted and unaccounted for, mourned and unmourned. Dearly beloved, we pause to remember and honor your souls. We remember you for who you were and what your lives signified to us. You will always be in our memory, in our prayers, and in our hearts. May I please ask you to join me in standing to observe a moment of silence. Thank you. You may now be seated. I would now like to invite a man to the stage who is a pillar within our community. And like most Rwandan Americans here, he lost many members of his family during the genocide. He will introduce Mr. Edward Kaihura, a survivor and author who will share his story today. Please welcome Benson Garambe. Ladies and gentlemen, Rwandese who are here, distinguished visitors, and those sympathizers who came to share with us this commemoration of 20th day, years that uh, the genocide uh, surfaced in uh, our small country, Rwanda. Thank you for being with us here. Your presence here is really bring, being appreciated. Being here for these few hours means a lot to us. We thank you for coming here. Within a few minutes here, I will be introducing uh, a man who is a first-hand survivor of genocide. His name is Kaihura Edward. You may wonder how come people killed each other in Rwanda? How did they know who was a Tutsi, who was a who, who was a Hutu, who was a Tua? However, in Rwanda, it's different from USA here, whereby you know everybody, even your neighbors, up to about two, three hills away. 
And uh, it was very easy to distinguish who was who to be killed. Because all the three tribes, they spoke the same language, but they had dif different physical features. So it was very easy to be targeted, whether you're a Tutsi or a Hutu or a Twa. So for the Tutsis had nowhere to go. It was easy target because they knew who you are just by your physical features. If you're tall and you had a small nose, long nose, long face, no segments, you are a target, you are dead. If they could confuse about you, they will ask you what you had in your pocket called identity card. Everybody was supposed to bear identity cards. And in those identity cards, there was a name, Hutu, Twa, and Tutsi. If your name is not, you are a Tutsi, you are obliged to die. So it was easy that way. For those who had done intermarriage and they could not be distinguished, they had to ask you a card. And if you didn't have it, some of the Hutus also died because they almost looked like Tutsis. So ladies and gentlemen, being here to know the story of Rwanda is utmost, utmost important to us. Listening to us, looking at those pictures there when we remember our loved ones, it's a very, 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 cons we, you just console us just by being a witness here. Mr. Edward Kaihura is among the few survivors who survived the genocide. By few survivors, I mean that in a city like Mishawaka, you could only have like maybe five or three people who survived the genocide. That's it. In the whole Indiana, you could have maybe like a hundred, even less than a hundred people who survived the genocide. So we have those handful. And even after the genocide, those handful who survived were killed and targeted by the militia who remained in Rwanda. Kaihura is among the survivors of genocide. He's the first hand witness. He comes from a city called Jitesi, district of Kibuye, where I also come from. It's a place whereby we have a lot, we had a lot of Tutsis in that uh, district. But it's marked as one of the brutal districts that had suffered the genocide of Rwandans. He luckily survived, as any genocide survivor in here can tell their own horrific story. He luckily survived because he was in a hotel, um, the Mil Colin. All of you know about this hotel, uh, Hotel Rwanda movie. That's why he managed to survive. That's why he was hiding. He will tell you into details about that. Um, he managed to grow up and became uh, a former Rwanda prosecutor in charge of the prosecutions of genocide crimes and crimes against humanity in Kigali, Rwanda. He holds a graduate degree in a law and a master's degree in criminal justice. And he is the author of Inside the Hotel Rwanda, the surprising true story. For those who have seen Hotel Rwanda, that was a little brush off. I may give it one out of 10. I may even give it a, like a four or a three. True story was not revealed in details. It's a good movie to watch. But if you read his book, it will tell you in details about the surprising true story about the Mil Colin Hotel Rwanda, I mean. And it also, if you can go to his uh, website, www.insidethehotelrwanda.com, it will also elaborate to you exactly what surfaced in Rwanda. Kayura will also participate in the panel discussion here uh, to, describe, to discuss rape as a weapon of genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, the genocide in Rwanda was carried in different ways. Everybody here, me, Gatete, Gaitan, Bayangana, so many of Tom, will tell you how each of our parents died in a horrific different ways. There was more than 500 ways each of them died. Some were hung, some were just put in mass grave when they were still alive, some were pulled by the cars, some were stabbed, killed by the guns if they paid money. So there was a different thousands of ways that these atrocities happened. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't waste your time. I'll welcome the first-hand genocide survivor, Kaihura Edward, on the podium. Thank you.
Thank you, Benson. Uh, distinguished guests. Let me start by greeting the organizers of this 20th commemoration of the genocide against Tutsi and expressing my gratitude to be here to share my personal experience. To me, the genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda suggests human butchery, general slaughter, sexual torture, rapes, and carnage. This was not a war of bombings. Instead, the genocide was planned and executed by the Rwandan government against its own people. The killers were right on machetes, spears, clubs, handguns, rifles, and other law take weaponry to carry out this execution at close range. As they said, I was born and raised in Karondi, in the west province of Rwanda. I grew up in a family of seven children, three sisters, and four brothers. It was never a time in my life when ethnicity was not a dominant part of my existence or the existence of any Rwandan of my generation. All Rwandan were mandated to carry a national ID card with them all the times. The most important piece of data on the card consists of three words, Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. Two of the three words were crossed out. The one word remaining define your total experience in Rwanda. Much like a caste system, though, during my lifetime, far more evil, this I had no choice but to accept. When I was young, a culture of stra strategic disenfranchisement and demonization was entrenched among our nation's leaders. As a child in school, we Tutsi were asked to stand up separately while the Hutu sitting down, or Hutu were asked to stand up while Tutsi were told to stay down. While this did not cause any physical harm, it followed the classic pattern of how the genocide breathed, us versus them. In my native Rwanda, I was at them. I witnessed true violence against my family for the first time at the age of eight. It was in 1973, and I was in third grade. We had early release from school. Our teachers didn't tell us why we had to leave early. When we get home, all Hutu families, all Tutsi families were gathered together to protect their homes. <coughs> Women and children were asked to go to hide in the bushes. We spent one week in the forest. When we came back, our homes were burned, our cows, everything we want, were taken away. We spent a time in a shelter until a new house was built. Around the same time, my oldest brother was in third high school. He was succeeded in surviving, but eventually, was expelled from school and was not given a chance to go back. In the 90s, Rwanda was rife of violence and hatred on many faces. Tutsi were afraid to mingle, to even meet with one another and talk. More than two people 
were not allowed to stand together in public place. Militia were trained, weapons were disputed, machetes were imported, and hate media were created. Tutsi were no longer human. We were labeled as cockroaches. I lived this, listening to these voices of hatred every day until those voices rose up as loudly as possible to mark the beginning of the mass killing, the genocide of 100 days. After work on April 6, 1994, I found myself in a cafe in Kigali watching an African Cup of Nation played on a television set when I decided to go home before the game was over. It was close to 9.30 p.m. As I walked to my home, the air was filled with radio broadcast. The nation had gone collectively insane. I heard voices that spoke unspeakable things. Savagery was all I could hear. By the grace of God, I managed to make it to my home and bolted myself inside. I walked around my house looking for evidence, evidence against me. My existence was now a crime. Street justice was now dealing with my crime of simply being and born and known to others as a Tutsi. The militia were trained and heavily armed suddenly ruled a nation. If I found any news criticizing the government anywhere in my house, I destroyed them, tearing them into little pieces and putting them in the toilet. I was sure the Hutu would come to kill me. I lay down on my bed, but I slept not a wink. At daybreak, I stood in my living room, looking out of my window, and I saw a coworker of mine walking up the street. He was a radical Hutu who hated Tutsi. He shouted, wake up, wake up. There are cockroaches in our neighborhood and we must find them. I did not take his threat lightly as I knew he was active in extremist groups, most of which were now armed. I ducked out of, I ducked out of my home and hid. Sleeping between houses and through people's yards, I head toward a friend of mine who happened to be Hutu. His name is Pascal Itimana. Soon after I had left my house, the militia came to kill me. When they arrived, I was not inside. They destroyed my house and shared all my belongings. They searched my neighbors, but they could not find me. In Pascal's bedroom, there was a tiny space, large enough for me to get in and get out, yet not enough to be noticed without moving a large dresser. If I heard something, I was to quickly run to Pascal's room and get behind a dresser. I spent four days in his house. At night, I was going to sleep in the trees surrounding his property. Each visit from the militia was more frightening, more severe, and carried more blatant traits of violence. They were whistling and yelling, search for the cockroaches and wake them out, wake them out. Pascal finally confronted me emotionally wrecked and asked me to leave. I begged him to let me pass the night and I would leave the next day. I paced, ruminate all night long, wondering where I could go when the light reappeared. I was convinced it was my last moment to be alive. 
but because the sake of Pascal and his family, I had to leave. Leaving Pascal's house, I felt like a man committing suicide or facing the gallows at the roadblocks, which were now everywhere. Everyone government's ID was checked. I knew if it said Utu, it meant life. If it said Tutsi, it meant death. I began to think of how I could destroy my ID because it would betray me and cause me my demise. I tore it into little pieces and put the pieces in the trash. Ask Pascal to accompany me out of town. On our way, we had to pass near the home of office of the local authority, the conseiller of Sikhti Chahafi. I thought to go ask him if he could give me an official looking paper that simply indicated I had lost my ID. He would not be watching for my ethnic identity, but he would be confirming that he knew me, nothing more. He agreed, but doubted I would leave another hour. My initial plan was to leave the city by foot and go to the south of the country. I had no idea if I could go there and how I could pass through the roadblocks. Meanwhile, radio broadcasts were broadcasting that there were cockroaches hidden in the Hotel Milpolin. I tried to convince Pascal to accompany me to the hotel. Naturally, he was reticent, but eventually he agreed. We had to pass three military roadblocks. At the first one, I was asked to lay down. A soldier was ready, ready to shoot me. Pascal said, please don't kill him. He is ours, meaning I was a Hutu. Finally, we arrived to the ground of the hotel where UN peacekeepers stayed. This was the hotel that was made famous by the movie Hotel Rwanda. I am sure many of you have seen that Hollywood movie. Speaking officially for the nearly 1,200 survivors of the Hotel Milkolin, we are grateful that any movie was made about our plight. Unfortunately, most of us are less than pleased with how this particular movie was scripted. Our tales are quite different from what you saw on the movie screen, but our stories are all true. On April 16, Horus Sabadina, the, the hero of the movie Hotel Rwanda, came. He was the manager of the Hotel des Diplomates. The diplomat had hosted the official, officials and senior military leaders of the new government that was carrying out the genocide. It was where the exact plans of the genocide were laid out. The new government was obliged to leave the capital because Rwanda, because Rwanda Patriotic Front was shelling bombs on the hotel, dislodging their host Porus Zawadina as well. All this, those departing the diplomat had to pass by the Hotel Milkolin, which was one mile away. When Paul arrived and assessed the situation, he tried to take over the management. The front desk employees refused to give him the keys. Paul contacted the corporate office in Europe and they sent him a fax authorizing the employees to hand him the keys. The first meeting Paul had with the employees was to make sure all refugees paid before they get food. This despite the fact that most of them, they had no money. Akashia was set up in the restaurant. Before you get food, you had to pay. Only leaders who had money could go to the hotel restaurant and get food. The rest were left to starve. Even though we were in the most luxury hotel in Rwanda, 
we did not feel it. We felt hopeless and helpless. Soon after, Sesavajina also began charging the refugee for the rooms. If you don't pay, you were removed from your room. I was called personally in his office and I signed him a check. My roommate paid him cash. We were, we were using phone call to call international organization for rescue. Paul cut the phone, service except one which was in his office. We ran out of water and began drinking the swimming pool water until it was drained. Electricity was cut and we were afraid that any point we would be overrun and killed in the darkness. The leaders of the genocide, Onel Bagusora, General Bismungu, Ramila Frodoar, George Rutaganda, Robert Kajuga, were coming to the hotel from time to time, usually spending their evening drinking with the hotel manager. As the day stretched on, we were waiting for the day when the military would turn the, their guns on the hotel and shell it. Bombs hit the hotel three times, but no one were hit, were wounded. The militia tried to storm the hotel, but they were turned by the UN peacekeepers. When the Rwanda Patriotic Front took control of the Kanombe military camp, it was a big loss for the genocide government. 800 soldiers and their families surrendered to the General Romeo Dare. Romeo, General Romeo Dare handed them to the Red Cross, and the Red Cross handed them to Uganda Patriotic Front. The capture of these surrendered militaries and their families, along with some Hutu refugees who were in other area controlled by the, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, forced the government, the genocide government, to agree to protect the refugees who were in the hotel mid Corinne in order to exchange us with their people. In the meeting held in the Hotel des Diplomates, UN peacekeepers, militia, and the genocide government decided that the refugee in the Hotel Mil Pauline would be exchanged for Hutu being held in the Rwanda Patriotic Front Zone. This really was the reason we were saved. Nothing of this is captured in the movie you have seen. At the end of May, Bernard Kushner, the founder of Doctors Without Border, came to visit us. He facilitated negotiation between the genocide government and the Rwanda Patriotic Front for our evacuation. We were asked to write our names on a piece of paper and slip it under the door of the UN peacekeepers, indicating which zone we want to go to. Our only rational choice was to go to the Rwanda Patriotic Front. On the day of evacuation, a delegation from Rwanda, Rwandan military and UN peacekeepers were there with trucks. Before we go onto the, a truck, Paul Sesabagina checked to make sure no one take any hotel towers. Whatever number of people went into a truck to the Hotel Mirkorin, the same number entered a similar truck in the Rwanda Patriotic Front Zone. It was, like a, it was like a prisoner exchange. Truck from both sides left at the same time and met at on a grid upon point. Those from the hotel were escorted by the UN peacekeepers and the Rwandan military, and those from the Rwanda Patriotic Front were escorted by the, by the Rwanda Patriotic Front military and the UN peacekeepers. Once they get to the point of exchange, only UN peacekeepers escort could cross. 
after the exchange point, we began smelling life around us. Finally, we could say we are safe. On July 4th, the Rwanda Patriotic Front took the capital, and on July 6th, we were invited to go back into Kigali. The city was deserted. All we could smell was the stench of dead bodies. The ferocity and the, gr and the grotesqueness of it was beyond our comprehension. But now all was silent. The bodies and the body parts laying about the city as if it all had been done by some brutal natural force, not by man himself. As the time passed and more area became secure, I decided to go to my village to examine what was left of it. I was suddenly strange, stranger to where I was born. Perhaps has, has become almost impossible, covered with bushes. Along my way, I could see one bone, one human bone here, another human bone there. But no one was left to tell me their tale. The entire village was eliminated. The ethnic Tutsi were eradicated there. When I remember them, I ask myself why God had left, let me to stay alive alone. It was not only survivors guilty, I felt, but the feeling one has when he or she feels for the loss of a loved one. But those few of us who survived the genocide wait for the loneliness that came from losing dozens upon dozens of people who had played a role in our lives. We lost parents, siblings, teachers, priests, doctors, neighbors, friends. We had grown used to see, to seeing every day of our lives. All gone now. All gone, all at once. It is a strange feeling, the feeling of being in a familiar place, yet everything that had, had once been familiar had vanished, never to return again. What our reason for living? For surely, there was a reason to tell the tale, perhaps. There wasn't enough tears. Ten years later, I was shocked to discover a Hollywood film was made about my very adventure. I was elated by confused. Living as, living as I do now in America, I have come to learn that most of Americans, this movie is the only knowledge of the genocide against the Tutsi. Perhaps had it not been made, most of them would, would not have no idea of what we went through 20 years ago. But outside informing the West of the genocide, I found the movie completely inaccurate. Though the school children through the, the Western world assumed that one inanimate hotel manager single-handedly survived over 1,200 people seeking refuge in the hotel Mirkolin. Nothing could be further from the truth. We were saved because of the international intervention from diplomats. We survived because refugees were protected by the UN peacekeepers. We lived because the genocide wanted to disprove there was genocide at all by displaying us to the Westerners. Later on, we were kept alive because we were used in hostage exchange, exchange with the, those who held prisoner by advancing 
of Rwanda Patriotic Front, and finally, we escaped unharmed because the Rwanda Patriotic Front took Chigari and freed of us. 20 years of, after the genocide, we are remembering our loved one killed because they were born and known to others as Tutsi. I call on every survivor to think back to these horrific days of mass killing and remember a mother, a sister, a niece, or any other women who were subject to rape, sexual torture, sexual violence on, on a massive scale during the genocide. The violation of Tutsi women was not a casualty of war, but a step in the process of the construction of the Tutsi group, the construction of the spirit, of the will to live, and of life itself. While many women were killed through the genocide, the perpetrators often spared women from death. Instead, sentencing them to rape and humiliation. The sexual violence took many forms. The militia and the military raped Tutsi women and girls, forced them into collective and individual sexual slavery, and mutilated them. Even every young children did not escape. The term, pregnant women, who had recently given birth were not spared. Their rapes frequently resulted in death from hemorrhaging and other medical complications. The perpetrators forced some women to kill their own children before and after being raped. The militia commonly employed sexual mutilation and public humiliation to heighten the suffering of their victims. Some women and girls were stripped and slashed and exposed to public mockery. Some women were held for the duration of the genocide. They lacked these women their home, while some terminal arrangement forced marriage and called the women wives. In reality, these women were captives of sexual slavery. The trauma experienced by these women did not end when their torture finally ceased. The physical, psychological, and the social impact is something they will live with the rest of their lives. 20 years, after the, 20 years after the genocide against the Tutsi, is there hope? Rwanda has made significant progress in promoting gender equality and combat, combating gender-based violence. Rwanda is only one country in the world where over half of its elected members of parliament are, are women. Women have the same rights to inherit land as men. However, the victim of rape and other gender-based violation carries severe social stigma. The physical and, and psychological injuries they suffered are aggravated by the sense of isolation sense of isolation. Women who have been raped or who suffered sexual abuse generally don't dare reveal their experience publicly, fearing they will be rejected by their family and the community. Often, rape survivors suffer extreme guilt for having survived and been held for rape rather than having been executed. The horror of the genocide against Tutsi is unique, but the lesson we learn from it 
are absolutely, absolutely applicable rights across our society. Across our society, at home and abroad. As we say, never again. Let us flee now and not look away from what we are born. Let us understand all that the genocide really is, for in doing so, all people of good conscience must see that such atrocity should never exist upon this earth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kaidura. Your survivor testimony um, has been able to show us that there isn't always a single story, and it is always important to remember that. And although the movie Hotel Rwanda did bring the genocide in Rwanda to the forefront of the international community and to the world, it is important to remember that it was a Hollywood movie, and your portrayal and your tale as a survivor is very important to us too put it into context.